Let's take a detailed look at ventricular filling and we're going to look first at the passive filling or rapid filling phase. As you can see on the, the figure on the left, uh, we're going to start a discussion, and I, I know I just mentioned that previously, but just as a reminder, we're going to start our discussion of the cardiac cycle or our dissection, I guess, maybe you could say, as we look at the details here. Um, we're going to start with ventricle filling because to me that seems like a more logical place to start, but everybody has their own opinion on that. So what I've drawn here on the right is a very simplified reductionist type figure. Uh, that I find helpful in many cases to describe what's happening. So you can imagine, if you will, that this is the left side of the heart, or maybe it's the right side of the heart. The exact side of the heart doesn't really matter that much. Let's consider the left side of the heart. Um, and so if this were the left side of the heart, the veins would be identified, these would be my pulmonary veins. And all I've done to represent that is essentially draw a box. This is very, very simplified. Then we would have my left atrium, again, just kind of box-like in shape, and my left ventricle. Uh, and then for my artery, that would be my aortic artery. That would be the aortic arch. And then the branches that extend from that aortic arch. Now during this passive filling phase, or rapid ventricular filling as it's better known, so this is the better term for it, and something you should be aware of, I want you to look first at the valves. Always pay attention to the valves. This valve right here is my atrial, atrial ventricle valve because we're on the left side of the heart. This is my aortic semilunar valve. Just aortic valve for short. Notice that I've drawn it in its open state. Now let's look at the other valve. Uh, I'm sorry. Whoops. Let's try that one again. This is not my aortic valve. This one is my mitral valve, also known as my bicuspid. This other one is my aortic valve. My, my apologies. Okay, so the mitral valve is open. Notice my aortic valve is closed. And the valves will tell you, um, essentially think about it as controlling traffic. So at this moment, we're allowing uh, cars to drive into the ventricle, if you will, or blood cells to drive into the ventricle. But we're not allowing, the gate is closed, they're not allowed to enter into the aortic artery yet. Now the movement of blood, and for that matter, the movement of any liquid, is always going to be from high pressure to low pressure. This represents the driving force. And I'm hoping that this makes sense to you. There's a reason that water flows downhill. Um, there are driving forces at work on the water uh, that keeps the water moving. Water will also flow from high pressure to low pressure with gravitational forces in being involved. And likewise with blood, high pressure to low pressure. And so in this particular case, our high pressure system is actually the pulmonary veins. Now for clarification sakes, they're not they don't really have a lot of pressure, but in this particular instant, in this moment, as we are filling the heart with blood, let me just assign a, a number to this pulmonary vein, and I'm going to make up this number without actually knowing the experimental details. If I, you know, I would have to stick a probe into somebody's heart to know for sure what the pressure is. Maybe somebody's done that, but I certainly haven't, so I don't really know what the average pressures are and have been too lazy to look it up. So we're just going to pretend that the average pressure here is 5 millimeters of mercury here. And that's going to direct blood flow into my atria. And gen just to again assign some numbers here, let's just go ahead and say my atria is 2.5 millimolars of mercury. We're talking really small pressures here. And then in my ventricle, what are we looking at? Well, maybe my pressure in my ventricle is going to start at like one millimeter of mercury. Now that number is going to change as I add blood to the ventricle. As blood is added to the ventricle, the blood creates pressure in here. It's like we're blowing up a balloon. So here's my opening. The mitral valve is the opening. So imagine, you know, you're blowing a balloon, you put your mouth on the opening of the balloon. Well, 
when we force air into the balloon, it creates pressures on the walls of the balloon. Obviously, the ventricle is not really a balloon, it's a muscle, or it contains muscle, but nevertheless, like a balloon, as we begin to add blood to it, that pressure is going to increase. So one millimeter is going to begin to climb um, and increase in pressure. And I'm not going to assign a value to that, but we're going to increase in pressure until we are equal to the pressure of the atrium. And we'll talk more about that. So I'm actually rather going to show you the arrow. I'm going to actually erase the arrow and just going to say increases. So we understand that it's going to increase in pressure. And then I want to highlight these arrows right here. This is the pressure of the blood. As we force the blood into the ventricle, this is the pressure of the blood. Um, as it flows into the ventricle balloon, so to speak, it's going to press against the walls of the ventricle and cause them to stretch out a little bit. This entire process occurs without any contraction of muscles. Let's take a look at, so we've talked about the atrial valves. Let me double check myself, make sure I'm talking about everything. We've talked about the sem, uh, AV valves, the semilunar valves. The atrium is in diastole, ventricles in diastole. And then I talked about the pressures here. So notice I have the pressure in the vein as being greater than the pressure in the atrium, which is greater than the pressure in the ventricle, which is less than the pressure in the artery. Now, how do I know that the pressure in the artery is greater? Well, one way to know is look at the valves. Always look at the valves. Are they closed? And in this case, the answer is yes. But if the answer is yes, then high pressure is in the arteries. I'm going to just write P. And that's actually true. Uh, again, I don't know exact numbers. I, I know basic ballpark numbers, so, but we could assume, for example, maybe that the pressure in the aortic artery is a whopping 100 millimeters of mercury, okay? And obviously, that's much, much greater. Now, you I just told you that high pressure flows, or that blood flows from high pressure to low pressure. So if that fact is true, then my blood should be flowing in this direction because this is my high pressure system. So why on earth is it not obeying the laws of physics? Well, it actually is, but we have these valves right here, big old valves, uh, we can have the pressure there and it wants to move back into the ventricle, but it's not going to because of the valves in the way. And so since the valves are in the way, um, the blood really has no other choice but to move onward down through the systemic circulation to other tissues of the body. Importantly, in this state, this rapid ventricular filling state where the atria is in, atrium is in diastole, the ventricle is in diastole, everything's moving into the ventricle through passive flow just due to pressure differences, 80% um, of the ventricle is filled during this phase. So that's actually quite a lot of volume. So if we consider maybe the average volume of a ventricle is around 135 milliliters, well, 80% of that um, is going to be filled without any kind of contraction from either atria or ventricle. This, by the way, is one of the reasons why it's so very important for the muscles to relax um, so that we can have that filling phase. Without that, we're just not going to get that ventricle full. And so this is my passive filling phase, or also known as my rapid ventricular filling phase. And closely related to it then, that we're going to take the next look at next, is my active filling phase, which again, that's not the scientific, that's not the consensus term for it. Most people refer to this as atrial systole. I use the term active to suggest that we're going to be using ATP here, and this is indeed the fact. ATP is now going to be used for the atrium to constrict right here. And so you can see I've drawn some arrows here to represent the fact that we are now constricting the atrium, and that's occurring through the contraction of those cardiac muscles in the atrium. And notice again, once again, always please look at the valves known as my uh, atrial ventricle valves, also known as my mitral valves, since we're on the left side of the heart, are open. And that if you compare and contrast, let's look at this stretched out ventricle, not very stretched, a little bit stretched, versus lots stretched. Um, this increased amount of stretch is due to the force of the atria that is being generated as it forces additional blood into the already mostly full ventricle.
mostly full, being 80%. Um, that last oomph that the atria provides, atrium provides, gives us an extra 20%, okay? And I want to highlight these numbers and briefly talk about these numbers. And we will be looking at the ECG, the electrocardiograph later, and talking about different phases of the um, electrical signal as it travels through the heart. But one thing I want to talk about is a common disorder that you may have heard of, or a relatively common cardiac disorder called atrial fibrillation. In atrial fibrillation, we don't get uh, atrial systole. So atrial fibrillation, AFib, as it is sometimes talked about for short, means essentially atrial systole, I'll put this symbol here to say, yeah, it's not happening here. Atrial systole doesn't happen. People survive AFib all the time. Now, they may not be out there running marathons or um, climbing up massive staircases, but they survive. And the reason they survive is this atrial contraction is only giving them that last 20%. And while that last 20% is important for flexibility, in terms of our ability for athletic activity, uh, the simple reality is we can live off of 80%. And so that's one of the things I wanted to highlight is those volume differences there. Some other things to pay attention to, again, always uh, when you're thinking about the cardiac cycle, you need to always think about pressure, valves, volume. Those are the things that you need to really focus on as well as the systole or di diastole of the atria or the ventricle. Now, notice my ventricle is still in diastole. We have not begun contracting any, any kind of cardiac muscle in the ventricle, but we are contracting the atria. Um, this is actually important that we coordinate that contraction. The ventricle is a much stronger muscle. And so if these two muscle groups were to contract simultaneously, there's no doubt the ventricle would win that battle and blood would flow the wrong way. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen. And so we coordinate that with the electrical activity of the heart, which we're going to look at in more detail later. I'm not going to necessarily assign pressure values to this, but I do want to make sure you look at this. That as the atria contracts, now the pressure of the atria is greater than the ventricle. And it's more, more greater, that's not a, a grammatically correct term, but anyway, more greater than the ventricle because we know that it's using physical ATP force or ATP generated force to shove in a little bit more blood. Ventricle stretches out more. You're going to hear me talk a lot about ventricle stretch a little later on when we talk about how blood pressure is, is regulated, how blood flow is regulated. So ventricle stretch is going to be an important concept to understand. Stretch. Sure. Um, and so uh, keep that in mind when we talk about ventricle stretch that essentially we're, at, we're talking about how much can we enlarge that ventricle. And as we stretch that out, we're also lengthening, we're, we're forcing the cardiac muscles to become stretched as well and lengthening the sarcomeres. And we'll revisit that idea in a bit here. Notice my valves are still closed. My aortic valve is still closed. And if we were to look at this, we'd still have a pretty high pressure. I don't know for sure if it would still be 100 millimeters of mercury. I know that that's a, an acceptable average pressure, but I, I don't know that it would necessarily stay here. I think it would probably fluctuate between like 130 and like maybe 90 or something to that effect. Don't quote me on that, but that's kind of ballpark numbers, rough estimates. Um, but nevertheless, we still have a very high number. And once again, even though the laws of physics would say, okay, blood is supposed to flow back, back into the ventricle, that is prevented by the fact that we have those valves closed. So blood is going to follow the path of least resistance in this case, and that would be through the rest of the circulatory system.